Okay, so this is nursing one, and we are on chapter 40, which is disorders of the pancreas, diabetes, mellitus types one and two. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna pull up the PowerPoint so that I can go along with you and help you better understand it, okay? And I will minimize our faces. So what are we going to talk about? We're gonna talk about the pathophysiologies, the differences between type one and type two diabetes mellitus. We're gonna talk about risk factors, signs and symptoms. What are the causes, signs and symptoms and treatments for high or low blood glucose? It's very important. We're gonna discuss how diabetes mellitus, and I'm gonna add in here, uncontrolled or poorly managed, increases risk of complications like heart disease, blindness, kidney failure. We'll talk about the tests that we use to diagnose it. We're gonna talk about therapeutic measures to help patients with diabetes mellitus control their blood sugars. We're gonna talk about the differences between insulin and then the oral medications to lower blood sugar. Nursing care, nursing education, diabetic foot care. We're gonna talk about safety measures for somebody with diabetes who is going to have any type of surgery or surgical procedure. We're gonna talk about reactive hypoglycemia, how we treat it. So we have a lot to talk about. This is where we're gonna start. Diabetes mellitus, we're talking about sugar. And when we talk about sugar, we're talking about carbohydrates, okay? So just understand that all carbohydrates, whether they're simple carbohydrates or complex carbohydrates, are sugars, right? And all sugars are carbohydrates. Now, the white sugars, in other words, like white sugar that you would put in your coffee or that you would use to bake with, and things that are made with sugar like that. So in other words, cakes and cookies and pies, ice cream, sweets, all the good stuff. Candy, those are simple carbohydrates. And you need to understand that with all of them, just think about a kid on Halloween and they eat all that candy and they're running around like lunatics. But then a couple hours later, they crash. Simple carbs, simple sugars are in quick, out quick. They will raise your blood sugar real quick, but then they will be out of your system real quick. Where the complex carbs, things that are brown, brown sugar, brown rice, brown pasta, brown breads and grains like rye, wheat, they are long acting. And so you eat them and they will keep blood sugar at a stable level for a longer period of time. And I know you're gonna laugh, but here's the way to remember it. If it's white, it ain't right. If it's brown, we're down. Remember it like that. So when you're talking about carbohydrates, sugars, you need to know the differences between the simple sugars, which are just the bad, fast acting, white sugar candy crap, or the complex carbs, which are the ones that are slow, long acting, and good for you. Because if you remember, back in A and P in term one, we talked about the cell and remember the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell that makes adenosine triphosphate, ATP, energy. In order to make energy, you gotta have carbs. Your cells use carbohydrates as their primary source of energy, right? So you must have carbs, you can't eliminate them, but what kind of carbs you eat are important. So now let's proceed on with the pathophysiology of diabetes mellitus. So it can be several things. It can be an intolerance to glucose because your pancreas isn't making enough insulin or any insulin, or because your cells and tissues have become desensitized to insulin. And when we talk more about insulin, insulin is an Uber driver inside your body. Just remember that. Okay. So glucose intolerance, altered car carbohydrate metabolism, and we'll get to that, and then long-term complications, which can be horrible. Talk about that in a second, okay? So 
Here is a beautiful little chart that explains those simple carbs I was talking about, the white things, white potatoes, white rice, white pasta, white sugar, complex carbs, the brown things, right, that are, that are longer acting. When you eat, if you are a healthy human being, you eat and you eat something with carbohydrates in it. it goes to your stomach, your stomach breaks it down, and then it goes into your small intestines, and that's where it gets absorbed into your bloodstream. When the glucose, the sugars, leave and go into your bloodstream, if you're healthy, your pancreas goes, oh snap, we need insulin. And your pancreas will send out the Uber driver insulin. Insulin's job is to drive through your blood and grab all the sugar, bring it to your cells to feed them, <clears throat> excuse me, so they can make energy. And if there's any left, It'll bring it to your liver and store it in case you need it later. Okay, and I'm gonna say that one more time. I'm actually gonna pause the share just to make sure that this is clear because this is very important, okay? Insulin, just picture it. Get in, get in. When you're a healthy person, you eat anything with carbs in it or drink anything with carbs in it, your pancreas goes up, there's sugar in the blood, Send out the Uber driver insulin, and insulin drives through the blood and grabs all the sugar out of your blood. Get in, come on, get in, get in, get in, and drives around to your cells and says, here's some sugar, here's some carbs, eat. Manj, manj, eat, right? So you can make energy. And any sugar that's still left in the Uber will drive right to the liver. Here, liver, hang on to this for me. I might need it later. Okay? And it's stored in the liver. That is if you are a healthy, individual. You are not a diabetic. That's the way the system works when it's working properly. Okay. Okay. But then things can go wrong. So if you are a diabetic, here's what can happen. I go back to my share. Okay. So with diabetics, either the pancreas doesn't make any insulin. So there's no Uber driver, right? There's no Uber driver. And so the sugar is just stuck in your blood. Well, it can't feed your cells if it's in your blood, right? And we're going to talk about what those consequences are, okay? With diabetes mellitus, there are two types. Diabetes mellitus type 1, which used to be called juvenile diabetes, that is an inherited, it's congenital. So in other words, it's written in your DNA. You're going to get it. If you're going to get it, you're going to get it. It's got a sudden onset, boom. You're fine one day, the next day you pass out, they bring you to the hospital and your blood sugar is 800, okay? It can happen anywhere from young childhood, which is very sad, up to like early to mid thirties. And when you have it, you are on insulin and only insulin for the rest of your life, the end. And the theory is, is that diabetes mellitus type one is an autoimmune disorder. So your immune system attacks the pancreas's ability to make insulin and the cell's ability to accept the insulin delivering sugar. So in other words, the cell's uh, sensitivity. So type one diabetes, young, sudden onset, boom, childhood to mid thirties, when you have it, you have it for life. There's no cure. The only thing we can do is give you insulin and only insulin, and it is autoimmune. Now we have type two diabetes. Now type two diabetes can run in a family. In other words, if your mom has it or your dad has it, if an immediate family member has it, you are at an increased risk of getting it, but it doesn't guarantee that you will get it. It just increases your risk. Type 2 diabetes, you can actually do to yourself. If you live a sedentary lifestyle, in other words, you don't move or sweat. Obesity, poor diet. By poor diet, I mean you just drink a lot of soda, a lot of simple carbs. You eat just a lot of crappy food, right? This has a gradual onset. Unlike type 1, it, your body will give you warnings, right? It'll creep up on you. And 
when it happens and we start to see like fasting blood sugars are elevated, people are gaining weight, they're heavy, you know, poor diet. You say to them, listen, you have to change your life. You know what? They, they usually don't, which is mind boggling to me. But anyway, they wind up diabetic. So gradual onset, usually older folks, people 40 or older. And so we can identify it. We can make lifestyle modification recommendations, but if they don't listen, they may wind up on oral medications. And then if they don't listen, they'll wind up on insulin. Understand, type one diabetes, there is nothing we can do about it except just give you insulin for the rest of your life. Type two, if you, in the early stages, follow instructions, you can reverse it. So you don't have to have it. The number of type two diabetics in this country is skyrocketing, okay? Can't, I can't emphasize this enough. Children are being diagnosed with type two. Never, ever, ever has that happened before, okay? Children, if a child becomes a diabetic, it's they have type one, but children are obese and they are inactive and they are actually becoming type two diabetics at the ages of 10, 12, 14 years old, which is scary, okay? So make sure you understand the differences between these two. Type one, also known as juvenile, you're gonna get it, it's inherited, it's congenital. It starts when you are a young person, child to mid thirties, comes on, boom, like a ton of bricks. You have it for life, there is no cure, the only treatment is insulin. More than likely, it's an autoimmune disorder. Most doctors agree. Um, there's nothing you can do. You can't reverse it. You got it. You got it. Type two runs in families, but there's no guarantee you'll get it just because a family member has it. You can do it to yourself. Poor diet, obesity, sedentary lifestyle. It's got a very gradual or insidious onset. It creeps up on you. Usually affects older people. And we treat it with lifestyle modifications. If that doesn't work. Oral meds, if that doesn't work, insulin. And nobody wants to be on insulin. Nobody wants to stick their fingers four times a day and then stick themselves with a needle four times a day. It's a miserable, miserable life, I promise you. Okay, so here's some statistics, but these are a little bit older, these stats, you know, 30 million people. That's a lot of people. 84 million are pre-diabetic. In other words, they're gonna have type two diabetes any minute now, the clock is ticking. And these numbers are old numbers. These numbers I wanna say are from 2016, okay? So if that puts it in perspective, we have somewhere around 350 million people in this country. And so look at those numbers, that's insane, okay? Okay. So here is even a more you know, specific um, explanation of type one. They used to call it insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Sometimes you'll see a chart that says IDDM. We're not supposed to call that anymore, so it's just called type one, also known as juvenile diabetes. It only accounts for about 5% of cases of diabetes in the country. There is a genetic component, it's autoimmune, and your pancreas is not making insulin right? And your cells are resistant. So, and it's more common in young, thin people. And we're going to talk about what ketosis is. And I'm sure every one of you has heard about the keto diet. You know, lose weight fast, do the keto diet. I'm going to give everybody a word of advice. If it took you five years to gain the weight or a year to gain the weight, you're not losing it in two weeks. And if you do, it won't stay off and or it's gonna hurt you, okay? There's no such thing as a quick fix, okay? If it sounds too good to be true, it is, all right? And then we have type two, and that used to be called non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, NIDDM, adult onset. 95% of the people with diabetes have this genetic component, it runs in families, but obesity runs in families too, right? They have reduced number of beta cells sometimes, and the beta cells are the ones in your pancreas that make insulin. And there's a reduced sensitivity to the insulin, 
the largest risk factor is being obese. I can't say that enough. The largest risk factor. And we're not talking about chubby, talking about obesity. In other words, 20% or greater over the recommended weight for the body frame. Okay. And with type 2 diabetics, they usually are not prone to diabetic ketoacidosis or ketosis, but we'll talk more about that later. So make sure that everyone understands these two different types, type 1 and type 2, who, who's at risk, you know, what the components of each of these disorders is. So, you know, you understand type 1, can't do anything about it. Type 2, you can, right? All those things. I'm actually going to pause recording and see if my current class has any questions so far. Pause now. Okay, let's continue on talking about diabetes. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. And so we talked about type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And let's go to, again, what I said earlier about type 2 diabetes in children. Okay. It's really, it's, it's almost at an epidemic level. Scary, okay? There is a type of diabetes, mellitus, called gestational diabetes. And that is only when you are pregnant, okay? Now, if you are a diabetic, type 1 or type 2, and then you become pregnant, that is not gestational diabetes, right? You already had diabetes and then you decided to have a baby, okay? But if you are not a diabetic and you are pregnant and your blood sugars start to become elevated, that is gestational, pregnancy-induced diabetes. We are not covering that. That's next term, okay? Okay. There's something called metabolic syndrome. And basically what it means is there is a body type that is the highest risk for this. They have the, sh the body shape where their waist is as wide as their hips and their chest, right? So in other words, there's not much of a waist to speak of. Their triglycerides are elevated most of the time. That's, that's fat in the blood. They're low. They have low high density lipoprotein, which is the good cholesterol. They don't have much of that. Blood pressure is usually elevated and their fasting blood sugars run high. People that fit that description, they are going to be diabetic and they're going to, they're going to have problems. They're at risk just coming out of the gate. Okay. Now let's talk about signs and symptoms. And this is in regard to type two. Okay. You got to know the three P's polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia. And poly means many or a lot. So polydipsia, you are thirsty all the time. Mouth is dry. I want to drink, drink, drink. I'm thirsty. Polyuria, all I do is pee. Polyphagia, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm so hungry. All the time, I'm hungry. People that present with those three Ps, those are warning signs. You're going to be diabetic. Type 2 is on its way. Okay, warning sign. These people also are fatigued, and they usually don't notice it because they're usually heavy, so they're fatigued anyway. You will have visual problems, like blurred vision, and I'm going to explain why in a few minutes too. They're prone to infections, this random weird abdominal pain, headaches, ketosis and acidosis. So people can have diabetes, like I said, but if it's well controlled, um, they don't have to suffer consequences. If a person is not compliant, they don't follow their regimen for medications or they don't follow their diet, or they don't get any exercise, they just basically don't do anything. My ex-husband will say, I'll eat whatever I want, I'll just take more insulin later, which is not good, but he's not my husband anymore, so you know he's not my problem. But I yell at him because he's still the father of my kids. Every time you have elevated blood sugar, and there's not insulin there as the Uber driver. To get it, take it out of the blood and feed your cells. What happens is put your baby to bed every night with a bottle of chocolate syrup. What'll happen? Chocolate just Hershey's every night, just let it sit in their mouth. It's 
going to happen. Their teeth are going to be rotted. They're going to have gum disease. The sugar is just going to eat away. Well, I got news for you. Every time someone's blood sugar is elevated, the teeniest, tiniest little nerve endings and the teeniest, tiniest little blood vessels, which are your capillaries, where your veins and arteries meet farthest away from your body, your tippy toes and your fingertips, mostly your tippy toes. Every time blood sugar's high, the blood sugar, the sugar in the blood, as it's traveling through, is just eating away at the nerves and the blood vessel, <laughs> eating away. It's also eating away at the little tiny nerves and blood vessels in your kidneys. And it's also eating away at the little tiny nerves and blood vessels inside your eyes. So the three complications of uncontrolled diabetes are diabetic peripheral neuropathy. That's they, the blood vessels and the nerves are eaten away in their feet and legs. They can't even feel their feet. Diabetic nephropathy, more people are on dialysis because of type 2 diabetes, uncontrolled, and they're going to go blind. That's diabetic retinopathy. So three biggest complications of uncontrolled blood sugar, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, diabetic nephropathy, and diabetic retinopathy. So if you keep on playing the game, just saying, oh, I'll just take more insulin later, whatever. Gonna wind up blind in a wheelchair because we've amputated at least one of your legs and you're on dialysis and your nickname is Stumpy. And that's not a good way to live. Okay. So the three biggest complications, and this is in the PowerPoint, just I'm gonna say it one more time. Diabetic peripheral neuropathy. In other words, when you hear apathy, Opathy, right? O P A T H Y. Pathos is the Latin word for broken, not working right. Pathophysiology, when your physiology is broken, right? Diseases, right? Apathy, neuropathy, nerves are broken, damaged. So diabetic peripheral neuropathy, damaged nerves at the periphery, in other words, farthest away, which are your feet and lower extremities right? Diabetic nephropathy, and nephro refers to the kidneys. Nephropathy, your kidneys are broken. And diabetic retinopathy, retinas in your eyes, opathy, your retinas are broken, so you go blind, okay? Not a fun way to exit the world, okay? It's slow torture is what it is, so. All right, let's go back to the sharing the screen and move along okay and so how do we diagnose diabetes well fasting blood sugars should be less than 100 right it's 60 to 100 right if it's persistently elevated let's say you go to the doctor and your fasting glucose is 120 or 140 and you go, well, that's not that high. Mm, but that's a warning. Nee, 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 nee. It's a warning, right? Normal is 60 to 100. Okay? If you have fasting blood sugars that are greater than 100, you're probably pre diabetic. That glucose tolerance test that I talked about earlier, greater than 200 after two hours. And that's called a postprandial, which means after eating, you're diabetic. If your hemoglobin A1C, glycosylated hemoglobin, is greater than 6%, you're diabetic. So we use these tests, fasting blood sugar, the glucose tolerance test, the hemoglobin A1C, to help us to diagnose diabetes. And then there are other tests that we can do, um, like I talked about earlier. People, especially with type 2 diabetes, I'm going to be looking at their lipid profile. In other words, what is their cholesterol, their triglycerides, right? High. How's their kidney function? So we look at the creatinine, microalbumin, which is a protein. So we'll do urine analysis, EKG. Prevention of type 2 diabetes. You have to sweat three times a week. That's all. Just three times a week. 
And if your BMI is greater than 20, you have got to lose weight. Period. BMI greater than 20, you got to lose some weight and you need to sweat three times a week. Okay. So therapeutic interventions for diabetes, small, frequent meals. If you're trying to start a fire, you don't just take a big log and put it on in the morning and then about four hours later, take another big log and then about four, six hours later, take another big log. No, the fire won't burn. You take little bits of kindling and wood and stuff like that. And every hour, two hours, you give it a little something, something, right? That's how your metabolism works. If you think that not eating will make you lose weight, it'll make you gain weight first. Small frequent meals, the right kinds of foods, will make you thin and keep you healthy. You need to exercise. And then, you know, if all else fails, we do have medication. We have monitoring and we do have education for people, but they have to listen in order for that to work. So for general principles, again, the biggest problem with both type one and type two, you want a stable blood sugar. You don't want blood sugars that are up and down and up and down and up and down. Blood sugars should not look like a roller coaster ride. They should be stable all through the day and night because if they are, you're not gonna have complications. You're gonna feel better, right? And you always, with type two, you wanna make sure that you are also monitoring your weight and your blood pressure and the fats in your diet, right? Here are the three apathies that I talked about, right? Diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and there's a whole lot to say about foot care for diabetics because that's a big problem. Diabetic peripheral neuropathy, retinopathy, nephropathy, okay? And an explanation. Exercise. Exercise lowers your blood glucose for up to two days, lowers the fat in your blood, right? You should exercise at least three days a week and exercise means sweat. I've had people tell me, I don't like to sweat. <laughs> I mean, no one likes to sweat, but it's good for you. You need to raise your heart rate, you need to exercise, okay? will refer people to a healthcare provider or even sometimes to an exercise physiologist if they have really good insurance. <laughs> um, we'll talk more about ketosis. I know you keep seeing that word pop up, but that's important. Um, people that are diabetic should always eat a snack if blood glucose is less than 100. And I will tell you this, for people that are diabetics, very unusual for them to have blood sugars less than 100. Even well-controlled diabetics will have fasting blood sugars of like 140, 160, which for them, that's good, right? And carry fast sugar. What does that mean? If you're a diabetic, you better never leave your house without some type of simple carb in your pocket or your purse, glucose tablets, or you know something that is a fast sugar. Because if your blood sugar should drop, we need to bring it up quickly because hypoglycemia can kill you just as much as hyperglycemia, right? So carry fast sugar, carry something with you, your blood sugar drops, and people that are diabetics, they can feel it. They become symptomatic when their blood sugar starts to drop, and they know, oh, I gotta eat something now, you know, bring that sugar up. So that's what fast sugar is. Medication, here, here we go, buckle up. Type 1 diabetics can only have insulin. Type 2 can have oral or insulin. Here are the insulins you need to know. You need to know. Glargine and Detamir, which are your long-acting insulins. NPH, which is intermediate acting. Regular, which is short-acting. And then Lispro, which is rapid. Those are the insulins that you must know. Okay? Have to, have to, have to. And what I will do is I will put a cheat sheet up with the insulins, with you know how, how they act, what their peak time is, what their onset time is, and everything that you need to know about these insulins. The Board of Nursing and ATI loves to ask about diabetes. Why? Because everybody's a diabetic. All right, I'm gonna pause recording for a minute, so, because I need to take a quick break. So we will be back. I'm going to stop my sharing and pause.